So good afternoon uh, all and everybody. My name is uh, Michael Collins and I'm the Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. And we're delighted, absolutely delighted to welcome you this afternoon to our latest webinar, which is a public event as part of our Future of the EU27 project, a project that is supported by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, many of you joining us today have attended previous uh, webinars that we have hosted at the IIEA and are familiar with the work of our institute. But a particular welcome also to those of you who might be joining an IIEA webinar for the first time. Today, our webinar guest is Michael Roth, Minister of State at the German Foreign Office in Berlin, who's going to be speaking to us about the German EU presidency uh, the challenges and the priorities in, uh, uh, in these days. As you all know, Germany will assume the presidency of the Council of the EU on the 1st of July 2020, uh, the first in the new trio presidency that will include Slovenia and also Portugal. And in his address today to the IAEA, uh, Minister Roth uh, will discuss the priorities as I said of the incoming uh, German presidency, including, uh, I would expect, the MFF, and recovering from the devastating impact of COVID-19, uh, the European Green Deal as a trigger for economic growth, uh, the digital transformation, and uh, the preservation of the rule of law. And I'm sure that we will also have an opportunity to hear from him on issues such as Brexit and the implications of the recent, indeed controversial decision of the German Constitutional Court. So the huge and demanding workload for, as I say, this incoming German presidency at a critical time for the European Union and, um, and the solidarity of its member states. And Minister Roth has been Minister of State for Europe at the German uh, Federal Foreign Office since December 2013 and Commissioner for Franco-German Cooperation since 2014. Uh, he was first elected to the German Bundestag in 1998. And between 2010 and 2013, he was spokesperson on Europe for the parliamentary group of his party, the Social Democratic Party of Germany. The minister will speak for about 10 minutes, maybe 50, up to 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor uh, to your questions and you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Um, a reminder that this discussion is fully on the record, both the minister's initial remarks and the subsequent Q&A. And just a further reminder that you can join the discussion on Twitter uh, using the handle at IIEA, and uh, we're also streaming live as well. And with that, and perhaps without the necessity for any further introduction, I now hand you over to uh, Minister Michael Roth for his remarks. Minister, you're very, very welcome to the IAEA. Welcome indeed back to the IAEA because you've spoken here before, but we're delighted to see you today in this format. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very great. I'm very grateful for an excellent cooperation as Michael served as ambassador uh, in Berlin, and um, I learned a lot from him and from his great team in in in, uh, in Berlin. And that's why I uh, accepted uh, the invitation, and it gives me the opportunity to listen to you. Um, I would like to invite you not just to listen to me, I would like love to listen to you because uh, Europe uh, is teamwork and uh, um, the EU presidency doesn't mean that Germany wants to rule Europe. We are more team players. We would like to build bridges. We would like to mediate and we would like to inspire the European Union in these uh, challenging uh, times. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's webinar of the Institute of International and European Affairs. Let me jump right into the topic. My ambition for our presidency is that we help the European Union become stronger, more sovereign and more solidly united. To break this ambitious approach down into more manageable pieces, I will concentrate on one general aspect that will heavily impact Germany's council presidency and Michael already mentioned it. Unsurprisingly, the number one priority will be European crisis response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. 
Undoubtedly, the COVID-19 pandemic will be a defining challenge for our presidency. During the past weeks, we have made significant efforts to reflect this challenge in the preparations and planning for the second half of this year. Our principal goal is to address this challenge in a well-coordinated way and ultimately to help make the European Union stronger than it was before the crisis. After, and I've, I'm very diplomatic, after a rather slow start, we saw ever increasing European solidarity concerning medical equipment, sharing hospital capacities across borders and helping bring home European citizens from all over the world. The same applies to fast and uncomplicated provision of testing capacities by a German laboratory that helped to bridge the testing gap in Ireland. Everyone involved really worked for a common purpose. Concerning our exit strategy, it's my strong belief that the way back to a status quo needs to be coordinated at European level. This includes the internal market, border controls, and travel restrictions. The presentation of the tourism package by the European Commission sent the right signal to the member states. And they were right to get to work on this quickly last week. Last week, we had two video conferences with our neighbors and with some of the main tourist destinations in order to coordinate measures for gradual reopening of borders and tourism industries. In the medium term, we must also learn the lessons that the pandemic is teaching us. We need to find a way to address future challenges in a more coordinated manner. No member state can tackle this pandemic or a similar scenario on its own. One example is a more comprehensive approach to the civil protection mechanism. We saw that joint and coordinated purchasing of medical supplies and management of these supplies would have strengthened the response across Europe. We also need to become more resilient against disinformation and fake news campaigns. Just last week, for example, the EU disinformation team needed to disprove the claim, and I quote it, the masters of darkness invented the COVID-19 and seek world domination. While this claim seems like wild fantasy to most of us, it's by far not the only one. The EU and we as its citizens are increasingly confronted with disinformation that seeks to perform it European solidarity. I think, I think this underlines why resilience against disinformation is another issue on our priority list for the German Council presidency. Talking about recovery from the pandemic brings me to the next pillar. To save lives, we needed to scale down large parts of the European economy and restrict social life. Millions of European citizens now live in fear of losing their livelihoods. Hence, we as Europeans need to support the most really hit countries and regions and show real solidarity across Europe. Germany is well aware of its responsibility for Europe. We are the biggest country in the very heart of Europe. We have a strong economy and that bears a special responsibility for the functioning, but also of this, for the success of our European team. In close consultation with our European partners, we will need to use all of the tools at our disposal to slow down and reverse the economic decline. Last Monday, Germany and France introduced their initiative for Europe's economic recovery. It's an ambitious program for solidarity and growth. And it shows that in the interest of solidarity, we are willing to move substantially from our traditional positions. We envisage a package of 500 billion euros as part of the next MFF 
that will be raised through borrowing on the markets. And that's completely new. But uh, we have to face an unprecedented crisis and that's why we have to think out of the box. This package shall allow temporary and targeted funding for sectors and member states most affected by the pandemic crisis and its aftermath. We believe that our joint initiative is a good basis for the upcoming Commission proposals. What we really need now is a spirit of compromise from all other sides as well. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Michael, the world will, however, not stand still. So besides coronavirus, after significant challenges must also be addressed. Climate, social cohesion, digitalization, rule of law, and um, the need to speak with one single voice based on a common approach to other global actors like the United States, China, Russia, and others. During our presidency, we will have to tackle a wide range of important topics, many of which are somewhat impacted by the current situation. We will negotiate the so-called multi-annual financial framework, which is, of course, closely linked to discussions on recovery from coronavirus. However, we need to make sure it, it's a green recovery. The fight against climate change and the European Green Deal remain key priorities. What we really need is a socioeconomic transformation. And climate is uh, one of the key uh, priorities for all of us on the global stage. And the European Union uh, must play um, a very ambitious role in, in order to convince others who are much more reserved because they think climate, for instance, climate protection is a job killer. It's definitely not the, the, the case, but we have to deliver and we have to act right now. This green recovery is more and more linked to digitalization and technological serenity of the European Union. We are still at the start of this process. However, we are gaining traction. Ireland, as one of, the, of Europe's digital hotspots, has lots to contribute to, to the discussion. Furthermore, although it's currently not in the spotlight, migration and finding solutions to ongoing events at our southern and eastern borders remain an important topic during our presidency. The same applies to the rule of law, and um, I would like to conclude with uh, the rule of law because it's crystal clear. The European Union is not just a single market. We're not just a currency union. We are first and foremost a union of common values. And these values bind everybody. But we are under pressure. We are under pressure by nationalists, populists, outside the European Union and inside. Our European model is under pressure. And we have to make clear that peace, stability, order, prosperity, on one hand, democracy, human rights, rule of law, respect to minority, are both sides of one coin. And this European model needs credibility. And we have to regain trust and confidence in this model. And that's why um, the rule of law uh, is on the, on the top of our uh, uh, agenda for the next uh, semester in the European Union. Last but not least, maybe I, I, I disappoint you a bit. I haven't mentioned the word Brexit. but. Brexit will also dominate uh, our agenda, like uh, the negotiations on the fishery quotas. But uh, I'm, 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 I'm sure you will raise other uh, uh, pressing issues of common interest. And so I'm looking forward to discuss with you. And thanks again, Michael, for inviting me. It's an honor and I feel really privileged.
Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and uh, thank you for that um, uh, contribution and, um, and, uh, and your commitment to the whole uh, European ideal is so, so very evident and so very obvious, not just today, but over, over so many years. Could I just, uh, just on that front, um, perhaps before we get to some of the questions, I mean, obviously the response of Europe, I think you were, um, you were, you said you were being diplomatic when you said that we got off to a slow start, um, and and that may indeed. Do you think it's possible to recover from that slow start in terms of any any damage that's been done to the credibility of of, mm. of our union, and and how mm. we've um, how we've managed this mm. existential crisis? Mm. Michael, this is a really good question. Um, I would like to, to to defend the European Union because a blueprint or a master plan uh, haven't existed so far. And that's, that's an unprecedented crisis. And um, the, 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 the EU competences are extremely low. And that's why member states were very much focused just on national measures. But it's obvious that this uh, pandemic um, doesn't care national borders. It doesn't have a passport. And that's why European measures are so key. So the first the first step was very much focused on national measures, but the second or the third step must be um, um, must be very much uh, coordinated with our European partners. And from my point of view, we we learned our our lessons. Um, it was a, a bumpy road, but at the end, it was worth it. Um, and coordination remains uh, a key for us because um, uh, our economy is very much linked to others. And without stability and, 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 and growth in our neighborhood, uh, it wouldn't work. And uh, Germany is one of the most export-oriented countries in the very heart of the European Union. And that makes it crucial to do our utmost best to support others, and to, to, um, to establish a functioning exit strategy and um, to establish a strategy in order to combat the um, tough economic and social consequences. Very good. Um, okay, um, just um, before we invite our, our listenership to, uh, to start sending in their questions uh, now, if they would. Um, on the recovery uh, package, um, how difficult was it for, for, for Germany, for the Chancellor, uh, you know, to, to compromise and to change the ways of, uh, of the past, to come to a deal uh, that is quite different from anything that, that Germany has been, um, mm. has been comfortable with in the past? I mean, is it the particular existential circumstances of the virus? Is it the state of the union? Um, and how, how, how difficult was it to, to move to this new position? And uh, some people might wonder, you know, why it took so long, uh, also in relation to previous crisis? Mm. Um, I don't want to overestimate the role of my party, but um, these ideas, the German-French uh, proposal is based on uh, social democratic uh, strategies. Um, our uh, vice chancellor and our finance minister was very much involved in uh, finding a sustainable uh, but also acceptable solution. And um, we had to take notice that um, the pandemic is an extremely, um, it, it was extremely, um, um, uh, uh, was extremely tough um, in its consequences in countries like Spain and Italy and and and, and France, and um, with with extremely dangerous consequences for economy and for the social stability in these countries. And that bears a special responsibility for us. And in good times, um, Germany and France could uh, create. Uh, compromises and uh, um, lines for compromises for others and that makes the Franco-German cooperation so valuable not just for our two countries but also for others. Um, if, so um, maybe for Mrs. Merkel it was a bit more challenging because she had to convince her own party uh, but at the end um, she was extremely successful um, her party 
had to take into consideration that um, the Conservative Party uh, is in public poll polls extremely strong because of uh, Mrs. Merkel's leadership. That was one of the main reasons why people um, are very much convinced that our strategy in com combating the crisis is a good one. So um, the Chancellor is extremely strong, much stronger than maybe four, five, six or seven years ago. We learned our lessons. Um, I, it was really painful for us a couple of years ago that many, many distinguished friends uh, across the European Union were rather disappointed about our engagement. They expected more, more solidarity, more inspiration, more ambition. And that's why I'm extremely glad that we achieved, um, that we achieved such a very ambitious uh, proposal. And now it's up to the Commission uh, to, to um, put another uh, proposal on the table. And I hope we can also, the, the, the countries which are a bit more reserved than uh, Germany or uh, France or the Mediterranean, especially the so-called frugal force, Austria, uh, the Netherlands, and also my friends in uh, Denmark and in, in Sweden. Yes, okay, uh, Michael, I think we'll come back to some of that in, in a little while, I'm sure it's part of the wider Q&A, but let me just get to some of the questions that have come in. Uh, the two of the first questions, indeed, I think coincidentally, are actually on China. Uh, one, the first one is from Port Murphy, who was indeed a, a former ambassador when, uh, uh, to Germany many, many years ago, and he's the chair of our IIEA foreign policy group. He said, the position of China in the world is going to challenge all of us. Uh, summit with China is scheduled for October uh, in Leipzig. Uh, what do you think might be the outcome of this summit? And a similar question from Catherine Meehan, Meehan uh, who's the chair of our IAEA Germany group. He, he, she asks, uh, could you give your views on the future of EU-China relations and do you think uh, that China is attempting to separate member states one from another? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this so-called uh, political leaders meeting um, will take place for the very first time, maybe in uh, in, in September, uh, organized by uh, the German presidency. Uh, it's a clear signal that the European Union has to stand united. Um, some global actors are rather interested in a more weak European Union. Russia, China. China, for instance, established um, the so-called 17 plus one strategy. Um, they are not very much interested in strong and reliable ties to the European Union and its institutions. They are more interested in bilateral relations to some uh, European uh, countries. But uh, at the end, um, the only chance to uh, be um, an influential um, partner on the global stage is to stand united and to speak with one single voice based on a common approach. My impression is that uh, we, we need to um, focus our, our dialogue with China not just on economic issues. We, uh, in, it's a huge political um, actor and China competes with us not just uh, in economic terms, but also um, in, 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 in terms of values, democracy, human rights, and so on. And we have to make clear that um, democracy, the rule of law, is more or less the self-insurance, and it's more or less the precondition for prosperity and for welfare uh, of the vast majority of the human uh, beings. Um, and that's why I'm sometimes disappointed that uh, the European Union quite often or too often sound a bit too technocratic and bureaucratic. Um, and that I will never forget uh, the, the very prof professional uh, campaign of China or also Russia and other uh, uh, regimes um, to to, to, to send signals of solidarity to Italy or to other countries, but um, the, the, the EU institutions in, uh, in Brussels were, were extremely weak and, 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 and reserved. 
um, and I hope that uh, we, we, we can strengthen the visibility, not just uh, in co combating the pandemic, but also um, to strengthen its visibility in, 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 the, in the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans illustrates how important it is to be visible, to be engaged, uh, to invest not just uh, money, but also um, the rule of law, investment in public administration, in fight against corruption. Um, at the end, uh, the European Union works rather good, but more in the background. Um, what we really need is a professional campaign uh, strategy, communication strategy, in order to convince others that the European Union remains strong, remains reliable. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and, and, and on the other hand, in, in, in concerning trade, uh, economy, but also uh, regional conflicts, uh, China remains one of the uh, most eminent uh, partners for us. And so uh, we should be very much interested in reliable uh, 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 relations to China, but not just on a bilateral basis. We need a strong and visible voice of Brussels in this, in, in this competition. Um, we have several questions in here on the, um, the, um, the German Constitutional Court uh, ruling, which I'll come to in a minute. I'll, I'll see if I can group them all together, uh, Michael. And, uh, but just uh, one or two more, though, on, um, on the rule of law. And uh, one from uh, Stephen Ryan in our own foreign ministry here. He says, you mentioned rule of law as one of Germany, a German priority, presidency priorities. What, tangible, what tangibly will the German presidency do in terms of the rule of law? Some feel that some member states are being let off the hook. Uh, will you ensure strict uh, financial rule of law conditionality under mm -hmm. the next uh, MFF? Mm -hmm. And a uh, second question here related to this from Etta McDermott, who's an IAEA member. She, he, she says, as part of a two-part question, but I take the second part first, she says, the rule of law concerns how does the German EU presidency propose to deal with the contempt uh, for the European law, for European law as demonstrated by the action of countries uh, mm. such as, she mentions, Hungary? Mm. Um, first, we have to, to, to use uh, the existing tools. Uh, like the Article 7 procedures with Poland and with Hungary, the infringement uh, uh, procedures. But at the end, what we really need is a mutual understanding of our rule of law principle, of our common and fundamental values. Um, I'm confronted quite often with, uh, with a very, very tough uh, a critical remark. Um, Michael, you don't understand our traditions. You are very arrogant. You are one of the typical Western-oriented politicians. You're never uh, interested in our traditions and our culture. But national identity and culture cannot be the exclusion for violations regarding rule of law. And we cannot offer political discounts if countries, member states, violate the principle of rule of law. Independence of judiciary is key for us. We all have different political systems, parliamentary systems. We have presidential systems. We have uh, systems with a strong parliament. Um, we, we have different systems, but at the end, what really, what really, what really matters is the independence of judiciary and a strong uh, uh, democratic voice of the parliament and a, a democratic elected uh, 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 government and many, many other uh, uh, pillars of our um, constitutional understanding. But we, re what, but we need a mutual understanding. And that's why we are extremely grateful to the EU Commission for the very first time in the history of the EU. Um, the EU Commission will present a rule of law report and in the council of ministers we would like to establish a new rule of law dialogue based on uh, two pillars the first one is a general dialogue on the situation of rule of law in the european union followed by a second session a more country specific discussion 
uh, regarding the rule of law situation in all EU member states. Maybe this is a chance to make clear that we are very much interested in a, in a non-discriminatory dialogue which treats all EU member states in the same way. The other uh, new tool we would like to introduce, and this is extremely delicate uh, because it's about money, uh, we would like to strengthen the tie between the EU funds, the money, and uh, the rule of law. Uh, if um, EU member states systematically violates the principle of rule of law, then uh, the EU Commission uh, uh, can introduce financial sanctions. Less money from Brussels. This is a very simple message to all of us. And I would like to take the opportunity, Michael, to explain a bit more the decision of the Constitutional Court because uh, it's not a role model uh, and it shouldn't be the role model for others. So, um, if you allow... I, Michael, just before you do that, maybe yeah. I could just pose a few questions that have come in on that. Uh, uh, just to identify sure. um, and maybe just to obviously underline uh, the level of interest in this uh, subject. But I noticed we've one here in here from John Bruton, our former Taoiseach. Um, how will you cope with the decision of the Karlsruhe Court not to accept the supremacy of EU law? Another from Pat Cox. Uh, the former president of the European uh, Parliament. He said the primacy of uh, the Court of Justice of the EU in interpreting EU law is the cornerstone of the Union's rule of law. Does the minister agree and accept uh, this proposition? And how does he evaluate uh, the court's recent challenge to, the, to, to this concept? And what does he expect to happen? So um, it's two questions there from uh, two very distinguished Europeans and uh, indeed two members of our board as well. So maybe just to, to, to identify uh, those questions and then allow you to continue. Uh, thank you so much and I fully understand uh, the, the, the rather critical uh, questions. The primacy of EU law over national law is an essential characteristic of the e Union's legal order. And this is an obligation for all of us, including Germany. The Constitutional Court has stressed that, like all national constitutional courts, it can only deviate from a judgment by the EZG on the validity of a European Legislative Act in extreme exceptional cases. So, in doing so, it, doesn't, it does in fact confirm its respect for the primacy of EU law. And that is my main message to all of you. Um, Germany, accept this order. We are aware of the reactions in some other EU member states. Still, the Constitutional Court judgment in fact calls on the ECG to examine the legality of measures more closely, in this case, the principle of proportionality, so it should not be mistaken for a pretext for anyone to do away with uncomfortable case law from Luxembourg on the rule of law. We hope and we expect that the Constitutional Court and the ECG will re-enter in a fruitful, constructive dialogue, which has for a long time been part of a vivid European legal and constitutional culture. But that's my wish, that's my hope, but I can understand the disappointments. So my message to you is clear. You should, you should please don't overestimate this decision and we should uh, uh, accept uh, the crucial and eminent role of the ECG in Luxembourg. Michael, do you see any uh, scope for the, the German government, uh, the German federal government, uh, appealing this uh, decision in any way, or is that an option that's open to, uh, to you as a government? 
the independence of judiciary is a binding uh, factor for all of us, uh, including the federal government. We are in uh, in, 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 in in close uh, contact to to the constitutional co uh, court. But at the end, uh, my position I already mentioned is not just my personal point of view. This is the federal government's uh, uh, position, and I very much uh, believe that uh, doubts regarding this guiding principle would be extremely dangerous for the functioning and for the balance between the EU institutions. And that's why I'm extremely aware of the discussion. And so my position and my government's position is hopefully rather clear. Okay, there, there may be, uh, I think uh, there may be, uh, maybe a few more. There's a big, big subject matter and uh, one that's obviously not going to go uh, away anytime uh, soon and, and complex as well. Uh, so maybe just to, to just broaden it out a little bit uh, and we'll come to a few more questions from our uh, audience in a second, but could you just talk a little bit about uh, transatlantic relations? Uh, I mean, uh, EU transatlantic relations uh, uh, and the prospects uh, there um, uh, anytime in the foreseeable future of, of an improvement in the atmosphere for a start and in the prospects, I suppose, also of a, uh, of, of a new EU-US uh, 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 trade deal under the current US administration? Okay. Um, it's not a, not a new phenomenon that uh, the transatlantic relations are not the key uh, um, um, issue on the United States uh, agenda anymore. Um, um, also, the Obama administration were very much focused on the Pacific uh, uh, region. And not just on the on the on, on, on Europe. The only chance uh, uh, for us is uh, to 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 stand united, to speak with one single voice, and to strengthen uh, Europe's capabilities, um, and maybe to take more responsibility on the global stage with our tools, with our um, security strategy. Um, the situation of the European Union, frankly speaking, is not so easy because we have to take into consideration that many EU member states are members of NATO. Others are uh, definitely they are not members, or they 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 have a rather they have a distance to to the NATO structures, and that's that's a bit difficult for all of us because NATO cannot be the only European uh, format for us. Um, so um, the European Union has to take more responsi responsibility. And my impression is that um, uh, Donald Trump wants to divide uh, the European Union. He was a big fan, and maybe he is still a big fan of Brexit, for instance. Um, uh, Brexit was for him a role model, maybe for others. Um, but um, we we learned also our lessons. Um, we won't solve any problems uh, uh, with leaving uh, the club. We will produce new uh, problems and challenges if we uh, leave the club. Um, and at the end, um, we 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 have to be as cool as possible in our dialogue with 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 Mr. Trump, with the President of the United States. But um, 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 strengthening the European capacities is, is key for us. Um, um, establishing um, a joint comprehensive approach in our neighborhood, Eastern Europe, Africa, Latin America, also China is extremely key uh, uh, for us. And uh, a lot remains uh, to be done. It's a long and bumpy road uh, because some member states are rather reserved in order to establish um, uh, a more uh, a joint uh, engagement. They are very much convinced that national relations, bilateral relations to the United States are more um, fruitful and uh, more valuable than uh, a European uh, comprehensive approach. And um, 
I'm not quite sure if we can solve this problem, um, but the, at the end, before we start negotiations with the United States regarding trade, for instance, we need a mutual understanding. What is our main purpose? What is our main objective in order to convince our citizens that um, a, 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 a trade needs, um, in a globalized world, uh, needs, needs rules, needs guiding principles um, um, and uh, at the end um, uh, such such agreements are uh, in, in in our interest but um, we need a more multilateral um, understanding not just in Europe but also in the United States and multilateralism uh, became under pressure not just by uh, Donald Trump but also by uh, Brazil yeah, uh, Brazil by 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 other uh, global actors, and that makes it so so, so crucial that we uh, cooperate, uh, that we uh, improve our 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 cooperation, that we strengthen uh, our ties to other, which do believe that multilateralism in the globalized world is the the best uh, 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 guiding principle for all of us, and it's a win-win situation for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Uh, just uh, by way of a, a follow-up question from uh, John Bruton again, just going back to the Constitution or the, the German Constitutional Court, um, and, and uh, obviously it's uh, this importance. He says, uh, just by way of a follow-up question, is there not a risk that others of the other Supreme Courts of the twenty-seven might have uh, their own versions of quote extreme and exceptional cases uh, unquote, where they uh, too might reject ECJ supremacy? I suppose. What's to stop every other country doing the same thing as Germany has done? Uh, again, um, I assume that was an exception, um, and uh, this decision uh, uh, won't be a role model or can't be a role model for uh, other uh, constitutional courts or supreme courts in the European Union. But at the end, um, the decision um, accepts. We shouldn't forget, except the very controversial uh, measures the European Central Bank uh, had, uh, had, to had, had, uh, had to introduce um, to uh, prevent the economic and the social consequences of the uh, crisis a couple of years ago. So um, um, the ECB decisions and measures were full in line with, with, with uh, our constitutional uh, um, um, framework. Uh, the only controversial issue for the Constitutional Court is the proportionality and the, the need to explain it um, um, to citizens, to the other institutions. And that's, uh, uh, that's uh, now a, a very delicate uh, discussion for us. Um, because uh, the Constitutional Court of Germany, of my country, uh, um, cannot um, um, bind um, European institutions, uh, so uh, it's 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 we have to we have to find a, a domestic solution in order to convince the ECB to be a bit more uh, transparent and to explain uh, uh, its its position. Okay. okay. Just uh, maybe just a little change of, of topic from uh, a question from Daniela Banchik. Uh, how will the German uh, presidency uh, ensure uh, to uphold the promise of the conference on the future of Europe will be democratic, uh, citizen-centered, and transparent? Mm. And uh, you know just what the time frame for all that is now. Mm. The uh, conference uh, uh, on Europe's future is very close to my heart because I love to talk to 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 citizens, and without public acceptance, it won't work. What we really need is uh, public acceptance is an open, uh, ambitious dialogue with the people about our common future. Um, my expectations uh, were extremely clear. What we really need is an open format, inclusive. We need not just centralized events in uh, Brussels. What we really need are uh, discussion events uh, all over the European Union, not just in the capitals, but all the countryside. We have to take the chance of digitalization. This webinar is a good example how we can invite hundreds of people to discuss with, with, with politicians, with scientists, 
about Europe's future and about uh, common challenges. That's another positive example how it can work in the European Union. So um, I, I took notice that um, the expectations in the European Parliament are extremely high. In the Commission, I'm not quite sure. And in the Council of Ministers, we are, we are far away from a political consensus we really need. Um, many, many member states are very much occupied by the pandemic, by COVID-19. And they are extremely aware of the economic and social consequences. The high unemployment rate, uh, the increasing number of, of people without perspectives, maybe they are going to lose their jobs. Um, our democracies are under pressure. Uh, so, um, for some distinguished colleagues, um, the, the, conference is, is, the conference is not the top priority on their agenda. And there is another elephant in the room. And this, the name of this elephant is treaty changes. Um, many member states are not really happy with a debate regarding treaty changes. I'm very open-minded. At the end, it's open. If, um, and we should, should um, propose a very, very open, broad uh, agenda. Uh, for the citizens. All issues should be discussed were in, 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 in common interest. And um, the, 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 the pandemic um, illustrates how important it is to strengthen the European Union on the global stage in combating uh, uh, climate uh, change, to combat uh, pandemics like uh, Corona, um, to, to, to be more visible on the global stage in uh, defending peace and stability and so on. But um, um, I, we, we are working very hard on a compromise, on a political consensus. In, in uh, 30 minutes, I have a conversation with members of the European Parliament um, and I hope at the end um, we will um, agree on a clear mandate which is also attractive for NGOs, for civil society, but not just for the usual suspects. If just the committed Europeans feel invited to be part of such a future conference, that's not enough. We have to take into consideration that in many states and many countries, people are a bit reserved. They and they need, we need, they they have they must have the chance to raise their concerns, their worries, their questions. Um, you mentioned um, the word the elephant in the room. Maybe there's another elephant in the room, and that's Brexit. And you kind of alluded to it uh, very briefly. We have several questions in here on that, and maybe I'll just try and capture the spirit of those questions. And um, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the German presidency. Um, uh, I mean, it's coming at a critical time on so many fronts, not the least of which also happens to be Brexit and much uh, and all is not centre stage in the way that it was, it hasn't gone away. So just one or two questions. One is your expectations, uh, if any, that in front of the British, the UK will look for an extension beyond, beyond uh, June. And uh, what do you think this, uh, a second question, what do you think the scope of, of any future uh, uh, deal is going to Mm. going to be and I suppose the third question is uh, the extent to which the, uh, the UK is engaged in any kind of uh, engagement with, with, with directly with, uh, with, with Germany um, in terms of uh, having their interests accommodated. Um, we already offered a very 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 uh, um, um, or we sent a very attractive signal to London um, the closest possible future partnership that's our offer to London. My impression is, unfortunately, that um, uh, some uh, partners in London discuss the Brexit with a very much ideological approach. But we need 
to be as pragmatic and as flexible as possible. And we already agreed on a basis for our negotiations. And this is um, the political declaration. And this is the withdrawal agreement. I don't understand why our British friends don't want to discuss with us um, uh, the foreign uh, and security policy. We already agreed that uh, um, a close cooperation concerning foreign and uh, uh, defense policy, security policy uh, uh, is, is part of a comprehensive uh, agreement. Uh, but um, our British friends don't want to discuss it. That was a big surprise for me and for, uh, for many, many others. And um, our British friends have to accept that not Germany or other EU member states sit in the driver's seat. The Commission is in the driver's seat. They negotiate on behalf on, of 27 member states with the United uh, Kingdom. Um, the UK will remain on the single market and the customs union, but the UK government has so far ruled out such an extension and so far we have no signs indicating that this may change. We have to respect uh, this view and we have to plan with this scenario. This, however, means that we need to make substantial progress very fast. Given the time that has been lost to coronavirus, the timetable is even more uh, ambitious. We are therefore very concerned that so little progress was made in previous negotiations rounds and that the UK on some topics such as foreign policy cooperation was not even willing to engage in negotiations so far. This is not in line with the political declaration that we jointly agreed on and the political declaration covers all areas of interest to the future relationship and defines them as one comprehensive package. And we now urgently need tangible progress across the board, especially on issues like the architecture of our future partnership or the question of fair competition, the so-called level playing field. I'm not sure, Michael, how we can achieve this um, by the end of the year. I'm not quite sure about this. I'm, um, I'm a very optimistic um, politician, and, um, but uh, I don't understand why our friends uh, in, 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 uh, in London don't want to uh, discuss without, uh, to maybe to postpone, um, to, or to prolong, the, to prolong the negotiations, um, that puts a lot of pressure on us, but not just uh, on us, but also on uh, London, on UK. Um, and I would like to reassure that the Irish interests are also our interests. And that was my message to UK. Nobody has the interest to divide the European Union. 27 member states speak with one single voice in these negotiations. Um, and uh, it's not a good idea to separate different sectors or interests. We have to combine it together and this is a whole package and that's why we should discuss and negotiate this ambitious package uh, together. But unfortunately, um, the timetable is extremely uh, uh, tight and the uh, time is running out. Um, thank you, Michael. And that message of solidarity is, is, is very much appreciated by, by, I'm sure, everybody here. Can I, I'm going to just ask one or two more questions. And I'm going to, they're not necessarily related, but just because we're coming to the end, basically, we need to get you out for your meeting with the European Parliament. Uh, uh, but just maybe, just, I'll just try and pick up one or two along the way here if I can. One from Shona Murray of Euronews, and she wants to know, going back uh, to the Frugal Four, uh, she basically wants to know whether they have the uh, the capacity, I suppose, um, the ability, uh, and whether their objections will uh, obstruct the passing of the Franco-German proposal, or indeed whatever eventually emerges from the uh, uh, from the Commission. 
And, and secondly, then, uh, just a question on the Green Deal, uh, maybe just to, to maybe finish on that. Uh, from Connor Spain, he says, how will Germany reconcile the objectives of the European Green Deal uh, with the recovery plan and the budget, and can both be achieved, um, mm -hmm. in your estimation? And I think once, you're, once you've uh, had a chance to answer those questions, we'll, mm -hmm. we, we'll end on that point. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just very briefly, I would like to start with, with, with climate. Um, and um, uh, you already mentioned it, the budget plays a key role in achieving uh, our goals. And um, our uh, expectation is, is very um, uh, uh, um, ambitious, but also realistic. Um, we would like to strengthen the tie between climate and um, EU funds. So 25% um, of the EU budget uh, must be uh, linked to climate. And uh, regarding common agriculture policy, 40% uh, uh, of the uh, agriculture budget should be invested into climate and should be uh, linked to climate. That's extremely ambitious, ambitious but it highlights that uh, we would like to start a um, uh, socio-economic um, uh, transformation of our societies um, uh, with a strong uh, link also to um, um, social pillar and also to jobs. Jobs are extremely important and we would like to invest much more money into uh, innovation and in uh, forward-looking um, issues. And that brings me uh, last uh, Oh, but not, I forgot the, the first point. Um, it was about the, frugal, the frugal four. Ah, the frugal four. Oh, yes. Um, okay. I'm very much in favor of regional cooperation. Um, in, in, a, in a European Union with 27 member states, it's, it's, it's extremely useful. Uh, to, to cooperate uh, on the regional uh, level that makes it sometimes easier to form uh, uh, compromises. But at the end, um, all regional uh, uh, cooperation formats uh, uh, should uh, uh, make a, 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 a constructive um, a contribution to unite uh, uh, the European Union. I don't want to comment um, the uh, counter proposal uh, of the, of the so-called Frugal Forum. At the end, maybe it's not a counter proposal. It's just um, 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 a valuable uh, contribution uh, because at the end, it's always good to compare different solutions together. And, um, Maybe, uh, or I'm fully convinced that at the end, our, um, our uh, uh, ideas and our proposal, the, the, the German uh, French proposal, um, has the chance to convince others because it's uh, in the framework of the EU treaties. It's extremely ambitious and uh, it gives us the chance to um, make clear that nobody stands alone in combating uh, the economic and the social consequences of the pandemic. Um, and um, at the end, maybe the European Union and its member states are much stronger than before the crisis. And that's one of our main objectives in our incoming um, German EU presidency. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Thank you uh, Minister. It's uh, just a great pleasure to see you again, to talk to you and um, uh, to know that the European spirit is so, so strong and alive uh, with you. So uh, with that, we're going to draw this um, um, webinar uh, to a conclusion to say thank you to each and every one of you, the large numbers indeed, who have joined us this afternoon. And we look forward to welcoming you back on a future occasion. Indeed, uh, another such occasion is on Friday, we will have Evelyn Regner, the chair of the European uh, Parliament's Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee with us uh, for another webinar conversation. So do join us on that occasion, but in the meantime, Stay well, stay connected. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank Take you, care. Mike.